It was 6 o'clock Monday morning. I was backing my car out of our garage on my way to catch the 6.45 train to my job in Manhattan. We lived in the small suburban community of Nassau Shores on the south shore of Long Island, just outside New York City. I stopped in the driveway to make sure the garage door closed before I pulled away from the house. The one time I forgot to check was two weeks ago. I received a phone call at work from an incensed Loren, accusing me of not caring about her. Anyone could have walked in and attacked or murdered her while I was gone. Of course, I knew she was right. I explained I just forgot and would make sure I would not forget again. That calmed her down some, but she still went on and on about how careless I had been. Didn't I care about her at all? How stupid could I be? I tried to calm her down, reminding her that I had not done it in the three years we had lived in the house and I would definitely make sure not to do it again. In the last two weeks, she seems to still be holding the mistake against me. Things have been decidedly cool at our house, and for the life of me, I could not figure out why she was still having these feelings toward me. My name is Jeff Carlson, and my wife is Loren. I am 27 years old. I am 5 feet 8 inches tall, have light brown hair that I wear long but not long enough to put in a ponytail, and have a closely cropped beard. I run the foreign exchange desk at one of the largest commercial banks in the country. In effect, we take advantage of the constantly shifting values of currencies around the world. The basic idea is to buy a currency and, when the value increases, to sell and make a profit. It's an occupation not for the faint of heart. In essence, we are gambling with the bank's money. It calls for a very refined sense of intuition and good timing. Buying too soon or too late, or selling too soon or too late, could cost the bank hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe even millions. The reason I received two promotions in the last two years is that my intuition is very good. Somehow, I can see when to buy and sell. I don't understand how my mind does it. Just looking at the trends, I get a feeling it is right to buy or sell, and my guesses have been right most of the time. The few times I guessed wrong did not matter when the bank execs figured out how many millions of dollars I actually made for them over the last four years. Loren is also 27, although a few months older than me. She stands 5 feet 6 inches with jet black hair worn just below her shoulders. She has a round face with soft Italian features and olive Mediterranean skin. She is visually striking to look at, at least I think so. She works locally in Huntington, New York, a town situated on the north shore of Long Island, approximately 25 minutes from our home. She works for a national medical insurance carrier. They are part of FEHB, they provide medical insurance coverage to federal and state employees. Most of her job is in the office in Huntington but sometimes they go to gatherings of many insurers and deal directly with employees to try to entice them to sign up during the open season. She has been there for two years now. Her direct supervisor is Jim Beckman. She has been working for him since she was hired. I have met him once or twice at company functions in the past two years. One was a Christmas party and the other a company picnic. He was bigger than me at 6 feet 2 inches tall and every bit over 200 pounds. It is quite obvious he works out regularly. He never did anything, but I just did not like him. Something bothered me about him. It was my intuition acting up. There was something out of place, and it bothered me, but not that much to make me mention it to Loren. As I watched the garage door close, I turned my satellite radio to the country western music station. The songs there were a little darker, just the right thing to match my mood. They sang about real things, failed marriages, unrequited love, and cheating spouses. As I drove down the street, the first song was about some guy who loved his bar. Catchy tune, but I did not get it. I came to a red light and stopped the car when a second song came on. As I sat at the light, it seemed as if my eyes were open for the first time in a long time. The singer sang about the same things that were going on in my marriage with Loren the staring out the window, seemingly not being in the same room, little slights, and sex that was most unsatisfying. I did not realize it, but I was sitting at the light with my mouth hanging open, listening to the song. When the cars behind me started honking their horns, I looked up, saw the green light, and started moving forward. I crossed the street, pulling into a shopping center parking lot. I sat and listened to the rest of the song play, then started heading to the train station. I must have been on autopilot because I do not remember driving there. 
I caught the earlier 6.30 train to Pennsylvania Station. As I sat on the train, I thought back to when I first met Loren. It was July, right after my 16th birthday. I would be a junior in high school when school was back. I was mowing the front yard for my dad when a moving van pulled into the driveway of the Miller's house two doors down. Old man Miller had died last year. Mrs. Miller was a nice but frail woman. One of her children lived two towns over and wanted her to live with them. Consequently, the house was put up for sale. I watched as a new BMW followed closely behind the moving van. At the time, I did not know their names, but Mr. Frank Scavo got out of the driver's side door and his wife Cheryl got out of the passenger door. Emerging behind her from the rear seat was the most beautiful sight I had ever seen. Loren Scavo was a few months older than me. Her hair was cut short, giving her a pixieish look. She wore tight denim shorts and a halter top that showed her tan midriff. She looked over at me and smiled. For me, it was love at first sight. A few days later, after the move was complete, I was casually walking down the street when I saw Lauren sitting outside with her mom. I don't know where I got the nerve to go over and introduce myself to them. Cheryl Scavo was a beautiful woman in her own right. Lauren was a miniature of her mom. Mrs. Scavo was smart enough to realize that I really didn't want to talk with her. She went inside to get some iced tea for us to drink. After giving us the tea, she went back inside, leaving us sitting on the stoop talking. I'm sure she listened in on our conversation while we sat on the front step. We got along great, and for the rest of that summer, I would hang out with Len every day. I filled her in on the school we would both attend in the fall. There was no hugging, kissing, or sex. To be quite frank, I was still a virgin and very shy. I was just happy to be in her company. July turned into August, and then school began. We were not in the same homeroom or any of the same classes, but we did eat lunch together and ride the same bus home each day. After only a week at school, I found out that the school was holding a harvest dance in the middle of October. The next day was Saturday, and I saw Mrs. Scavo and Len come home from food shopping. I went down to their house to help bring in the groceries. After the last bag was brought in, I asked Len if she would accompany me to the dance. She glanced at her mom and said yes. Her mom smiled. I found out later she really liked me and thought I would be good for her daughter. As September slipped by into October, I began seeing less of Lauren than before. She had made new friends with the cheerleaders. I knew she wanted to be a cheerleader from conversations we had during the summer, and she was doing this to get a spot on the squad. I did see her every day on the bus, and we always sat together and talked. Finally, the big day came. I was going to get to show off my girl to all the guys at school. I'm sure none of them thought that a girl like Lauren would be with a nerd like me. My dad drove us to the school as I was still too young to get a license. As we entered the dance, I saw some guys from the football team look over at us, and some of them smirked and laughed among themselves. I wondered what that was all about but decided to forget it and went to sit with my friends to have some fun. We had danced a few times and were sitting a few out when a slow song began playing. Before I could ask Lauren to dance, Billy Barber, the star linebacker, was there with his hand out, saying to Lauren, let's go, babe. It's time for everyone to know who you're really here with, Loren said as she popped out of her seat and walked away without a backward glance. I sat there with my mouth open, bewildered. I looked around at my friends and asked, what just happened? My friend Jack replied, it looks like you just got dumped. I glanced over at Loren and Billy, who were now dancing closely to a slow number, her hands around his neck and his around her waist. It became apparent this wasn't their first dance together. I could feel the color rush to my face. I felt so ashamed, I had been made to look like a fool. When the dance ended, Billy and Loren walked over to the football team's tables. Billy wrapped his arm possessively around her shoulders. Billy Barber was one of the biggest guys in school, and I knew I couldn't best him in a physical confrontation. All I could do was sit in my seat, feeling humiliated. I looked over at the football team, and they were all staring at me and laughing. At least Loren didn't turn around and join them in mocking me. I remained at the table for most of the night. I wanted to leave, but I wouldn't give them the satisfaction. I did get treated to Billy coming over to me, placing his hand on my shoulder and whispering in my ear, you didn't think that a nerd like you could get a girl like that, did you? 
he looked at me and laughed derisively, then walked away shaking his head. Loren never did come back to the table or talk to me for the rest of the dance. I could see she was having a great time with her new friends. I wondered if she was laughing at me too. Finally, the dance was ending. I dreaded what I had to do next. I walked over to where Loren was sitting with Billy and his friends. Loren, my dad will be here soon, and I have to take you home, I said. Billy responded, get lost, Carlson. She's going home with me. Loren, I snapped, I really don't care how you get home. If you don't go home with me, my dad will feel compelled to tell your mom that you left with someone else. You can explain to your mom why you came home with Billy. I turned and walked away. At that point, I didn't care if she walked home by herself. Soon, Lynn sat down beside me. She tried to make some small talk, asking, Did you have a good time at the dance, Jeff? I looked at her with disgust and replied, Are you from another planet? You dumped me for that a-hole Billy Barber. It was obviously planned. You don't say another word to me for the rest of the dance. Soon, I saw my dad's car pull up in front of the school. I stood up and walked towards his car. My sudden movement surprised Len, and she had to almost run to catch up to me. Dad's car had the windows open as it was a cool and pleasant fall night. As we approached, he asked us, Did you guys enjoy the dance? I didn't respond, and he got a funny look on his face. I think he could sense something was off. As we reached the car together, she waited by the rear passenger door for me to open it and for me to get in behind her. I had other plans. I opened the front passenger door, got in, and closed it, leaving Loren to get in by herself. My dad was furious. He told me to get out and open the door for my date. I told him I would if she was my date. I looked at my father, and his look said, What the hell is going on? As I sat in stony silence, Len opened the rear car door and got in. My dad shrugged and drove us home. Not a word was spoken. When we pulled up to the Scavo house, Lauren's mom was waiting at the door. My father got out of the car, as did Loren, but I just sat there. Lauren's mom could also sense that something was wrong. She knew I would normally walk Loren to the door. As Loren walked past her mom, I turned to look at her. I could see her mom look at my dad with a quizzical expression. She then looked at me. Loren turned to look back, and we caught each other's eyes. We tried to read each other's faces. I could not read Lauren's face at all, it was like a blank page. If she could read mine, it must have been filled with disgust and anger. When Dad got back in the car, he asked me what happened. I just told him that she found somebody she liked better than me at the dance. I never told him about her deception. He told me, forget her, son. There are plenty of fish in the sea. After that, we didn't talk much. Sometimes I would walk past her house, she might wave or say hi, Jeff. I always ignored her. One time I went by while Mrs. Scavo was out with Len, and they both said hi to me at the same time. I pointedly said, hello, Mrs. Scavo. Nice day, isn't it? I said not a word to Loren. It was as if she didn't exist to me anymore. Soon, Len stopped trying to talk to me. I would see her being picked up each morning by Billy Barber in his car with a bunch of other kids and being dropped off after school. She made the cheerleading team, I made the honor roll. After graduation, she went to work, I went to the Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania on a full scholarship. My folks gave me a big graduation party, the Scavos were invited, as they had become close friends of my parents. Loren was not invited. My folks wanted to, but I told them if she were invited, I would not show up for my own party. It was a surprise when Mrs. Scavo sat next to me. She told me, I was so surprised when you returned home the night of that dance. I thought you two made a great couple. I'm truly sorry that something happened between you that night. We made some small talk about Wharton School, and then she finally blurted out, what happened between the two of you that night? I looked directly into her eyes. It was like looking into Lauren's face, just the way she would be 20 years later, older, yet still young, with a smoldering sexuality. I had never thought about her that way before and quickly put it out of my mind. Finally, I told her, we realized that we wanted certain things out of life that night. We discovered they were different things. 
I really wasn't prepared to tell more of Lauren's deceit. She looked like she wanted to say more, but decided against it. She kissed me on the cheek, wished me luck, and left. My new job with the bank started in mid-June. That gave me one month to find an apartment in New York City, something close to work. Finally, settling on a one-bedroom, one-bath unit in the Soho neighborhood off Hudson Square. It was a great location with everything within walking distance, there was no need for a car. My new job was hectic, learning all the ins and outs of my new position. It had been taking up all of my time. There had been no time for socializing. It had been four months since I saw mom and dad. One evening, mom called to ask me home for a weekend. She told me I could stay in my old room, it would be no problem since half of my clothes were still there anyway, plus I was missing mom's home-cooked meals. Taking the train was the easiest way to get to my parents' house. They lived only a short eight-block walk north of the train station. Four blocks into my walk, a car pulled up next to me, beeping its horn. A high school friend named Becca was hanging out the window, yelling, Hey stranger, need a lift? Heck yeah! I yelled, it's hotter than hell out here. Hopping into the rear seat, I saw my old friend Jack behind the wheel. We sat parked on the side of the road and caught up on what had been going on in our lives the past four years. It was fun to be in the company of old friends. I didn't know that you guys were a couple. How long has this been going on? I queried. Becca reached her left hand out to show me her wedding band and engagement ring. You're married? I asked, astonished. Two years now, Jack replied with a smile. I had no idea, I replied somewhat sadly. I haven't been a good friend these last four years, have I? That's crazy, replied Becca. We haven't kept in touch with you either. It's just life. Thanks for that, Becca, was my relieved response. Man, it is really good seeing you guys again. With that, I could see an idea float up into Jack's mind, the kind of idea that should be given more serious thought, but he just blurted it out, Hey Jeff, we're having a party at our place tomorrow night. Would you like to come? Sitting in the back seat, I could see Becca turn to Jack and give him a look, it was a look men come to understand once they get married. It meant, are you crazy? Shut up. If I had understood the look, I would have declined the invitation. Since I'm just a guy and not knowing the meaning of the look, I guess I made the wrong decision. Sure, that's great. I'd love to. Are any of our old high school friends going to be there? I asked. Len turned and gave me a meaningful look and told me, yes, there should be quite a few. Great. I can't wait. I'll bring some beer. What time and where do you guys live now? Jack piped up. 7.30, we live at 135, Crimson Street, not too far from your folks, Jack said, putting the car into gear. We continued the four short blocks to my parents' home. I got out of the car, saying, see you tomorrow night. Visiting with my folks was nice, but I couldn't wait for Saturday night. Everybody must have changed in the last four years, I knew I had. It would be fun to see old friends and renew friendships at the party. I was talking to Kenny Carter, whose father owned a fence company. He had gone into the family business, and we were discussing how the company was holding up in the economic downturn when I felt a tap on my shoulder and heard, Hi neighbor, long time no see. Looking over my shoulder, I saw her, Loren, and standing next to her, a girl I didn't know. She was as beautiful and desirable as ever, yet the visage of a sneering Billy Barber and Lauren's back walking away from me was all I could think of. I turned my back to continue my talk with Kenny, but the other girl pulled me around by the shoulder and sneered, that was rude, dude. Not as rude as what she did to me, I snapped back. Jeff, please. You can't still be mad at me about that night. It's been six years, said Len. As sure as hell can, I fumed, turning and walking away. From behind me, I heard Becca exclaim loudly, see, that's why. Becca ran off to comfort Loren and her friend, while Jack pulled me to the outside deck. Jack told me I would have to make this right by Becca, he asked me to apologize to Loren. He pleaded with me, otherwise, no nookie for him tonight, friends don't let friends go without. So I sucked it up and went looking for Len. I found the three in the kitchen. Would you two mind leaving? I want to talk to Loren alone, I said. Loren's friend spat, no way. 
Leave her alone, you bastard. Becca intervened, saying, They're really old friends. Let them talk it out. Both girls left, leaving Len and me alone. We spent a few awkward moments of silence. When I decided to start the ball rolling, Loren, I want to apologize for saying what I said. I know you didn't expect it. What happened that night was so long ago. I have to tell you, my feelings and ego took a serious hit, and it came from a place I would never have suspected. I put so much trust in you. Maybe it's time to put it all behind me. No, you're right, Jeff. I did something deceitful. I acted like a little, didn't I? I did deserve what you said tonight. I never apologized for what I did. Would you accept an apology from me now? Loren asked. Thank you, Loren, and yes, I accept your apology, I said. Loren leapt into my arms, hugging me. We looked into each other's eyes, and then we kissed. Not a sweet, gentle kiss, but a demanding one with just the right amount of passion. We continued our makeout session until Becca and Jack walked into the kitchen, with Becca remarking, Well, I'll be damned, honey. Looks like you knew what you were doing. Jack gave a sigh of relief and then puffed out his chest, saying, Damn right, and don't you forget it. We all laughed and rejoined the party. Loren and I started a date, and nine months afterward, we were married. The conductor called out the next station, bringing me back to the present as the train began to roll out of the station. I reviewed the last three months of my marriage in my mind. When I finally got off the train, I was sure of it, my wife was cheating on me in our marriage. It seemed foolish to conclude that based on a country western song, but everything fit. I was sure of it, especially when the little voice that I normally found so comforting, whether telling me to buy this currency or sell that currency, was now sounding alarm bells that I could not ignore. As I walked past Howard Goldman on the way to my office, he looked at me strangely. I sat down heavily in my chair, with Howard hot on my heels. What's wrong with you this morning? he asked. Nothing, was my terse response. I get paid the big bucks to see that all my people are happy and content when they show up for work, Howard pressed on. I sighed. Are you sure you want to get involved in this, Howard? He nodded affirmatively. I looked at him and shook my head. No, I blurted out, I think Loren is having an affair. Howard's face registered shock. Are you sure, he asked. I answered truthfully, no, I'm not. It's just a feeling I'm getting. Your feelings are usually right, he acknowledged. Therefore, you should not ignore them. What are you going to do? I'm not sure. I just found out today, I replied. Don't worry about anything. I'll back you in whatever you decide. When you figure out what you want to do, let me know. My door is always open. I don't want you to spend too much of the bank's money today. I don't think you're on top of your game, insisted Howard. Of course, I knew he was right. I let my staff do most of the work that day and for the next two weeks after that. I think they liked the freedom to work without my input. I guess I had too heavy a presence for them to feel comfortable when I was around. I got up, closed, and locked the door. As I sat down, tears started to well up in my eyes and run down my cheeks. Some man I was, not even sure if anything was going on, and already, I was crying. I thought about a life without Loren. I loved the woman from the first time I laid eyes on her. I didn't think I could go on if I lost her. I put my head on my desk and closed my eyes, wallowing in my misery. I'm not sure how long I stayed in that position, but somewhere along the way, the pain turned into something else. I was no longer feeling pain, I was feeling anger. I thought about going home and confronting Loren. That would be really foolish, wouldn't it? What proof did I have? I had the lyrics to a country song. No, I would need to get proof. I would need to formulate a plan. I would make her pay. I would make whoever she was doing it with pay also. I wanted them to feel the same emotions I was feeling. They would feel the pain, I would make sure of it. I needed to make a plan, and soon. The first thing I did when I left work was purchase some voice-activated digital recorders and place them in unobtrusive areas around the house. I placed them in bedrooms, bathrooms, the garage, places where she might talk to someone while not on the phone. 
Then I attached a recorder on the telephones. I figured that was all I would need to catch her, just be vigilant, and she would show her hand sooner or later. I tried to act normal around Loren, but I guess I didn't do a very good job. I had installed the recorders on Wednesday, and by Friday, I had the first proof of Lauren's betrayal. Friday's incriminating conversation went like this. Jim, this is Loren. Why are you calling me at home? What if my husband answered the phone? Jim Beckman barked, don't worry. I would have made up a work excuse. I think we should back off a bit. Jeff is acting funny. Has he accused you of anything? No, he's not acting normally. He seems cold and distant. Maybe we should just cool it for a while. Okay, if you think that's best, fume Jim. Then he had an idea. Loren, you know I'm taking a trip to Miami in two weeks. Why don't I try to talk Fred into sending you with me? Then we could spend a week together. What do you think? I don't know. He might not go for that, even if you weren't acting funny the way he is acting might make him, well, I don't know. I don't want to make him suspicious. I could ask him and see what he does. If he acts weird, I'll be able to decide if he knows anything. Let me run it by Fred, and if he goes for it, then you can tell Jeff it's a work trip, laughed Jim happily. So now I knew for sure. Before this, it was just lyrics in a song. Now, it was real, Loren was cheating on me. She was planning to go away for a week of sex with that asshole, Beckman. As the realization hit, a heavy sadness came over me. I was sad for Loren, I was sad for our marriage. Slowly, the sadness turned to anger. That witch! How could she do this to us? How could she do it to me again? My pain morphed into anger. If she was cheating, I would get proof and divorce her skanky ass. I needed a plan, and I didn't have one yet. I arrived home from work at my usual time of 7.30pm. The trading had been unusually hectic, tomorrow at the market opening would tell how good I was at my job. There were millions of dollars on the line, and my mind was not where it should be. My wife was cooking dinner, she asked, giving me a kiss on the mouth. She was acting like she was happy to see me. This was something that had not happened often in the past few months. I was waiting for Loren to come to me with her adulterous lie about her business trip to Miami Monday and Tuesday. I was expecting it, yet it did not come. I had spent long hours outside, working on the yard or working on our cars, anything other than spending time with my wife. I was afraid I would blur out my knowledge of her cheating. I knew tonight would be the night. I hoped I would be able to pull off my own deception. It was a tough day. I'm glad to see you're in a good mood, I replied. I am happy, and I hope you will be too after I tell you my good news, she said. My day wasn't that great. You go first, I said. Okay, Loren giggled. I've been asked to go to South Beach to attend a seminar for the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. It's an all-expenses-paid stay at the Victor Hotel, one of the old Art Deco hotels on Ocean Avenue in the heart of South Beach. She crowed again, the bad part is I'll be gone from this Friday to next Saturday. I'll be gone for nine days. Honey, do you mind if I go? She looked right into my eyes, her head cocked slightly, trying to see if I had caught onto her deception or if I would only be mad that she would be gone so long. As I looked back into her eyes, I could see that they were alive with excitement, yet somewhere in there, a tinge of sadness crept through. Nine days is a long time. Honey, do you have to go? Is this something that will be held against you if you don't? I inquired. I don't know, Jeff. It might be. I know that Mr. Beckman is depending on me to help out at this seminar. It will be a feather in my cap if I do go, she added. I walked to the front door and looked out at the front lawn. I knew if I said yes, our marriage would be over. If I said no, it would still be over. In the previous four days, I had made a plan, and now I made the decision. I quietly whispered, if this is important to you or to your job, of course you can go. When will you be leaving? I asked. I couldn't hear you. Did you say I could go? She asked in disbelief. I could not say the words, as I knew my voice would crack. I just nodded my head yes. Loren ran to me and gave me a big hug, saying, thank you, thank you. This means so much to me. 
I promise you won't regret this. I already did. Loren would be leaving Friday from JFK Airport at 10.30 in the morning. I told Loren, I'll take time off from work to drive you to the airport. Loren looked surprised and suggested, you don't have to take time off, honey. Mr. Beckman volunteered to take me. No way. You're leaving me for nine days, and I want to be there to see you off, I said. What could she say? I'm sure she would rather have gone with Mr. Holy Beckman. But how would that look to her unwitting cock husband, I wondered. Her momentary look of disappointment was quickly replaced with a smile as she sang happily, That's great, honey. I would love for you to take me. What a great liar she was. I knew I upset the lover's plan just a little bit and felt a small amount of satisfaction. She only let her guard down for a second, letting her disappointment show. If I weren't so aware, I am sure I would have missed it. Thursday morning found me flopping into the big chair in Howard's office, saying, It's this weekend. Loren is going on a business trip to Miami, South Beach, no less. They're leaving Friday morning and returning next Saturday. Howard had fire in his eyes as he informed me, Whatever you want to do, you're covered. I spoke with Mr. Diamond yesterday about your situation, and he gave you carte blanche on the company credit card. You will have to reimburse the bank for any non-business expenses within two weeks of your return. When I asked Howard how I could thank Mr. Diamond, he laughed. A good single malt scotch whiskey will be payment enough. You probably don't know this, but he got screwed badly in his divorce last year. He hates cheating wives. I shook my head in disgust. I knew he had gotten divorced. I did not know why. Now I knew. Howard. I need the next two weeks off. I need to get proof of her infidelity. Take as much time as you need, within reason, of course. I will watch over your crew and make sure they don't screw up too much. Somehow, I am hoping this is all a mistake. Loren is a great girl. I still can't believe it, Howard confided. I am having a hard time believing it as well, I thought. I took the rest of the day off to make some purchases. Before I left, I went online and purchased a round-trip ticket to Miami International Airport on JetBlue Airways. I stopped at City Camera and purchased the top-of-the-line Canon digital camera that would take crystal-clear photos and videos with audio. It came with a removable optical zoom lens. The salesman said it would capture details like an eagle's from 100 yards away. Next, I bought a small carry-on bag and made a trip to Walmart for new clothes, shorts, tops, underwear, sneakers, and sandals. The last item was a New York Yankees ball cap. As a diehard Mets fan, Loren would never believe I would wear a Yankees cap. The tops all had patriotic sayings, flags, and eagles on them, styles I didn't normally wear. The last stop was the drugstore, where I picked up some new razors and a box of black hair dye. I was now prepared for my trip. I stowed the new luggage in the trunk of my car. All the purchases were on the company card. If Loren looked at our bank account, she would be none the wiser. I was ready, let the games begin. At home that night, I asked Loren for her trip itinerary. She would be leaving on the 10.30 morning flight from JFK on JetBlue Airlines, staying in room 314 at the Victor Hotel. Mr. Beckman would be staying in a different room, of course, he was, I was told. I would be on the 1.30 flight, leaving for Miami three hours behind her. I was also able to get a room at the Victor as well, I would be in room 541. I was hoping I wouldn't get caught checking in. We were up early Friday morning. I wanted to get to the airport by 8.30 so Loren would not have any trouble making it through security. The conversation was quiet on the ride to JFK. She tried to make conversation, but I was not very talkative. The realization that I was driving my wife to the airport to have an affair was having an effect on me. Her actions were breaking my heart, and I was very resentful, having trouble hiding my emotions. Jeff, are you upset? Are you alright with me taking this trip? You said it was okay for me to go, Loren asked. I know what I said, Loren, but the reality of you being gone for nine days is just hitting me. I know you have to go. I don't want to be away from you for so long. I'll miss you so much, it already hurts knowing you're leaving. I know you can understand that, I answered. Of course, I understand that. I feel the same way. 
It will be a long and lonely nine days away from you, Loren replied. Maybe so, but I will be rattling around alone in our home, while you will be in a glamorous South Beach hotel vacationing with the stars, I groaned. Loren laughed, is that what's bothering you? This trip will be mostly work, not too much vacationing, that's for sure. I looked at her and smiled sadly. I knew she was lying. We made small talk after that and soon pulled into the short-term parking lot. We made our way to the JetBlue curbside check-in, checked her bags, and picked up Lauren's boarding pass. We walked to the roped-off security area and saw Beckman waiting for Loren. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Loren give a quick glance to see my reaction to him. Beckman had the nerve to approach us, give Loren a quick kiss on the cheek, and then offer me his hand. All I wanted to do was deck this guy, but I worked hard to appear unsuspecting and friendly. I actually smiled as we shook hands. I knew I would probably get my ass kicked. He was six feet two inches and much heavier than me. At least I would have gotten in the first sucker punch. Maybe that would have sufficed. However, a fight was not in the plan. Jim spoke, Loren, we should start through security now. Nice to see you again, Jeff. I'll take good care of Loren while she is gone, Beckman said. I stood there and looked at him long and hard. Loren's face blanched. She recovered quickly. Jeff, Jim means that nothing bad will happen to me while I'm gone, Loren said. I turned to Loren and said darkly, I know what he means, Loren. I smiled at Beckman, saying, thanks for looking out for her, thinking I was fooled. Their faces brightened, and they turned to go through the security gate. Beckman went through the gate first and started to walk down the roped-off area. Loren was about to hand her driver's license to the large, black, female TSA agent when I caught her arm and pulled her back to me. Aren't you leaving and not saying goodbye to your husband? I asked. Loren looked at me sheepishly, giving me a hug and a kiss. She replied, of course. How thoughtless of me. I hugged her close to me, saying, I need to talk to you before you leave. We've never been apart for this long before. I want you to know that I love you, and I have since I was 16 years old. Loren smiled at me and was about to speak when I began again, you're leaving on a plane, and I will be driving home alone. Anything could happen to us. If, for some reason, you should never see me again, I want you to know that you are the best thing that has ever happened to me, and I love you more each day. If anything ever happened to you, I could not go on. I kissed and hugged her, saying, I love you. Have a good trip and come home to me safely. Loren spoke, I love you too, honey. I have to go now. As she started to leave me, I grabbed her arm and pulled her back to me. I had to try one more time to ask her not to go. She had a look of surprise on her face as I turned her to look at me. Loren, I know I told you it was alright for you to go. I meant it when I said it. But now that you're leaving, I find that I don't want you to go. It's still not too late. Tell Jim you can't go and come home with me. Blame it all on me. What do you think, Jeff? I pleaded. You know that I can't back out on Mr. Beckman at this late date. The tickets are bought and paid for, besides, he needs me at this seminar. I know I'm being selfish. I don't want you to go. I need you too, Jeff. I have to go. Don't try to stop me. My mind is made up, she said firmly. I stared into her eyes again, almost spoke, and then thought better of it. She turned and walked to the gate and gave the agent her license. My eyes missed it up as I knew she was lying. I'm sure Loren thought it was because she was leaving and I would miss her. I walked down the roped-off area to where Beckman was waiting. I watched Loren as she spoke with the TSA agent for a few moments. When she started walking towards us, I could see she was flustered. I wondered what they talked about that upset her. She recovered her composure by the time she reached where we were standing. They walked to the machines to get their belongings x-rayed. I watched Loren take off her shoes and place them in the plastic bin. She turned to me and shrugged her shoulders in a what-can-you-do gesture. She then turned to walk through the body scanner. By that time, I had reached the limit of my endurance and quickly walked out of the building. I was no longer angry, just resigned to the fact that Loren was no longer mine. I was becoming accustomed to the fact that we would soon be apart. 
I moved my car from short-term to long-term parking, retrieved my carry-on, and went back to the terminal. I waited until the departure board showed that Lauren's plane had left and went through security myself. I sat down to eat breakfast and wait for my flight. I arrived at the hotel by cab and checked in with no problems. The on-site barber was open, I had him shave my face and give me a very short crew cut. Once in my room, I dyed my hair black. When I was done, I looked in the mirror and thought even my mom would not recognize me. With my sunglasses and ball cap on, I could walk through the hotel secure in the knowledge that neither Beckman nor Loren would know it was me. The hotel itself was interesting. It was built like a U, the middle of the U faced Ocean Avenue across from Ocean Avenue is Lamas Park and then the Atlantic Ocean. Loren and Jim's room was in the right arm of the U on the third floor. My room was in the center of the U, room 541, with a great view of the ocean. In addition to the check-in area, the first floor held shops and boutiques. In the middle of the U on the second floor was an outdoor pool that ran the length of the arms of the U with chaise lounges placed around the pool. Towel and drink service were available. From the balcony of the room, I had a view of the whole pool area. Across the street was an entrance to the park boardwalk, the view of the ocean was magnificent. Under different circumstances, this would be a romantic setting. This time, it felt anything but romantic. I made the obligatory phone call to Loren around 8 o'clock. She picked up, saying, Hi honey, I'm glad you called. I rang the house a few times and you didn't answer the phone, I was worried about you. Where were you? She inquired. I stopped at one of the local bars with the guys from work. They have been raving about a club and talked me into going, that's all. I replied. She had the nerve to say, you better not be hitting on any girls there, Jeff. Remember, you're a married man. I don't think I could forgive you if you did. The gall of this woman. She's here to continue her affair with Beckman, and then warns me not to start one of my own. Why do you think I would cheat on you? Have I ever given you any reason to suspect me of betraying you or our marriage? You know me better than that. I could never hurt you by doing something as dirty as that, I laid it on thick. Now I know you would never do anything like that to me. That's why I let you go on this trip to Florida. I trust you completely. I trust you with my heart, even my life. You know that, you do, don't you? I asked. Of course, honey, I feel the same way too. I don't know why I said that. I know you won't do something like that to me, she stammered. Listen, Jeff, I'm really tired from the flight. I think it's making me sleepy. Will you call tomorrow? I'll be in a better mood, okay? Sure, Loren, we can talk tomorrow, I replied. Good night, Jeff. I love you, Loren added. Suddenly tired of the verbal sparring, I simply said, Good night, Loren, and hung up the phone. Did she catch me not saying I love her too? Would she even care, I thought. I spent a restless night in bed. Sleep would not come easily. My mind could only imagine what was going on in room 314. I awoke Saturday morning at the crack of dawn, awoke is the wrong word, as I was already awake and watched the sun rise out of the Atlantic Ocean. My plan was to follow the cheaters around the hotel. As it turned out, my room was all I needed. After a breakfast of scrambled eggs and pancakes in my room, I spent some time on the balcony. I was sitting in a chair enjoying the sun when out of the corner of my eye, I saw Loren walking to the pool with the jerk. As I sneaked into my room, an idea came to me. There were two large fake plants and flower pots in the room. If placed on the balcony, I could watch the pool area without being seen. Careful not to make any noise, I moved both plants to the balcony and placed a chair behind them. Then I went inside to retrieve my camera and tripod, placing it so the lens protruded through the fake foliage. I was sure the lens would not be noticed. By this time, Loren and Beckman were already on loungers and talking. Loren was sitting facing the arm of the U that contained their room, closest to me, and Beckman was on the other side. I realized Loren had done some shopping for this trip, she was wearing a red bikini with a skimpy top that showed off her cleavage, and the bottom was cut so high I was sure half her rear would be on display when she stood up. I turned the camera on and zoomed in on the cheating couple. Soon, I realized there was a flaw in my plan, I could not hear what they were talking about. I needed to know. 
I had an idea that I would tend to later. I waited for half an hour before I caught the first evidence of infidelity. Bless his horny heart, Beckman leaned over, turned Lauren's head with his hand, and kissed her on the lips. Lorraine returned the kiss, placing her hand on the back of his neck, pulling him into her lips. The kiss lasted a few seconds, then he leaned back into his chair. Over the next hour, I saw three more kisses before they stood up to leave. As they strolled off holding hands, it was clear to anyone they were a couple. I turned off the camera and retreated to my room. I fell onto the bed, a lonely tear fell from my eye. Sadness overcame me, and I was very tired. Seeing Lauren's cheating was much worse than suspecting it, though the feeling went away quickly. I took out my laptop and did a Google search for spy stores in the South Beach area. Luckily enough, there was one on Collins Avenue within walking distance of the hotel. Downing my disguise and with a brisk walk, I was soon back in my hotel room with just the thing I needed, a parabolic microphone and another tripod. It had the capability to plug into my camera, allowing me to add audio to the video I was taking. The microphone was placed on the new tripod next to the camera. Next time. I would be able to hear what they were saying. Waking up Sunday morning gave me a start, it was bright and sunny out. I had been exhausted, getting very little sleep on Friday night. After dinner Saturday night, I fell asleep and slept the whole night through. A look at my watch told me it was 10 a.m., Loren and Beckman could have left the hotel already, and this could be a wasted day. I went into the bathroom and did my morning ablutions. Getting dressed, I stepped out onto the balcony when I saw Loren and Beckman walking out of Llamas Park. I turned on my camera and microphone, then made a phone call to Loren. I was listening to what the camera was recording, I could hear Loren's phone ringing, the parabolic microphone was working as I hoped it would. I could see Loren look at the phone when Beckman said, Who is it? It's Doofus, Loren replied with a laugh. Beckman laughed too. Suddenly, a worried Loren said, I should take this. Something bad could have happened, why else would he call on a Sunday morning? She answered the phone, Jeff, is everything alright? Has something happened? She asked. I had an urge to say, no, doofus is fine, but held my anger in check. Instead, I replied, nothing's wrong, honey. I was lonely and just wanted to hear your voice. It's nice to know that you're worried about me. I worry about you all the time, Jeff. It's Sunday morning, and I thought something bad might have happened. You scared the hell out of me, barked an annoyed Loren. I was getting fed up with Loren's attitude and told her, I didn't know I would be such a bother to you, Loren. I was feeling lonely. I thought that speaking to my wife would cheer me up. Sorry to bother you. She started to answer, but I hung up the phone before she could get the thought out. It's no bother, she said into a dead phone. I could hear her talking into the dead phone over the parabolic mic. She turned her phone off and walked to a nearby bench. What did he want? Beckman asked. He was lonely and wanted to talk to me. Why did I snap at him like that? Loren asked herself more than Beckman. Beckman gave his opinion. Anyway, Loren, we've been having this affair for six months now. Maybe you're getting tired of him. It might be time to let him go. You know get a divorce. Then we could spend more time together. We won't have to sneak around anymore, he suggested. Right, she snapped. Your wife won't mind if we go to your house for a matinee, would she? Yeah, she said derisively. We won't have to sneak around anymore. Loren smirked, Jim, you make $38,000 a year. You have no prospects of doing better. After Jeff's last promotion with his year-end bonus, he makes almost 200 grand a year. I like you, Jim, the sex is incredible. But you're not that good. Jeff is not bad in that department, so I won't really miss out too much. But someday, he's going to be the CEO of that bank, and I intend to be there to share it with him. So there will be no divorce, get that idea out of your head. Besides, you will never get a divorce from Jane, you will never leave your two kids either, so stop bothering me about a divorce. You're right, Beckman replied almost sheepishly, but that doesn't mean we can't enjoy each other's company while we are here, right? Right, stud, my wife smiled, taking his hand as she dragged him across the street and out of sight. Six months, I thought, screwing for six months. 
she was only staying with me for the money I might make. I could work my bum off for us, and she would have her boyfriends, and I would get her leftovers. I could not get the callous remarks out of my head. That was not going to happen, not if I could help it. I wondered if I had enough to get divorced on my terms. I thought I needed more. I was determined to get it. Loren and Beckman were more than willing to help me get the evidence I needed. They did not know it at the time. At two o'clock, I noticed Loren walking to the pool again, wearing a tangerine-colored cover-up. Beckman was right behind her. I quickly turned the camera and microphone on, swiveling the camera until they were in the viewfinder. Beckman sat down while Loren remained standing with her back to him. She turned and took off the cover-up. I was shocked, and I'm sure Beckman was too. Loren had no top on. Beckman stared while Loren laughed and asked, You like? I like, Beckman replied, admiring my wife's body. She was wearing, or almost wearing, the tiniest tangerine-colored bikini bottoms. Loren essentially sat down next to Beckman, saying, The girls need some suntan lotion. Would you be a dear and help me out? She handed Beckman a bottle of lotion. He took the bottle and poured a liberal amount onto her body, starting to massage it into her skin. I couldn't believe my good luck to get this on video. Loren turned over onto her back again and asked Beckman, Are you going to lie back and get some sun too? At this point, one of the hotel employees approached, saying, Miss, some guests have been complaining about your display of nudity at the pool. Such displays are not allowed on the hotel premises. I must insist that you cover up. Sheepishly, Loren looked around and grabbed her cover up and put it on. They had to wait for Beckman's anatomy to go down before they could retreat to the safety of their room. I checked the camera to make sure it had recorded the action, it had. I felt I almost had enough. If I could only catch them in the act, I would be done. I made no phone call to Loren that Sunday night, I had called earlier. I felt like I had been rebuffed. Then again, Loren did not call me either. Monday morning, I awoke at 9 a.m. I ordered breakfast in, as usual. I thought I would spy from my vantage point on the balcony and see what I could capture with my new camera. It wasn't until 6 p.m. that I saw anything interesting. The doors to their room slid open, and Beckman stepped out onto the balcony. He was wearing one of the complimentary heavy cotton robes supplied by the hotel, tied in the front, leaning with both hands on the railing, looking out over the pool. I aimed my video and audio aids at the balcony and started recording. When Loren came out wearing a similar bathrobe, she came up behind him, giving Beckman a hug, saying, Do you think you can get the big guy up for another round, stud? I may need another 30 minutes or so, you've worn me out, he laughed. They started making out right there. This was the piece of compromising evidence I would need to prove adultery. It wouldn't make any difference in court, but might make a difference to Loren's mom and dad maybe to friends and other relatives as well. All this video was shot in public and would be admissible in any court. After watching the scene on the hotel balcony, I knew my marriage was over. The balcony video was now proof positive she was cheating. Maybe I should say more proof, she actually admitted it on the Sunday morning phone call. Hearing about it was hard, but seeing it was unbearable. I decided I had enough. I would be leaving tomorrow. I used my phone to confirm a flight leaving tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Luckily, there were a few single seats available. It was now an hour and a half since I saw Loren pull him back inside the room. I wondered if they had done it already. I wondered if they might still be doing it. I decided this might be a good time to make my nightly phone call to my loving wife. I hoped it would be a distraction. At just the right time, I dialed Loren's cell. She picked up on the fifth ring. What a surprise, she seemed out of breath. Hello, she mumbled. Lurin, are you okay? I asked with concern in my voice. It took a long time for you to pick up the phone, and you seem out of breath. I had to give it to her, Lorraine was a nimble liar. When she replied, I was in the shower when I heard the phone ring. I grabbed a towel and ran to answer the phone. You should see me right now, I think you'd get some naughty ideas, I chuckled. I sure I would, babe. I'm calling to see how your day was. Did you have a productive time at the seminar? Oh, she said haltingly, yes, Jeff, we had a good day at the seminar. 
I heard something in her reply. It was in her voice. It took me by surprise. I had never turned down a little phone sex with Loren. It was never really phone sex, just some titillating talk over the phone. Still, I had never turned it down before. This was a first. Yes, that's what was in her voice, surprised with shock and disappointment thrown in. She continued, How was your day, honey? I feel down, kind of sorry for myself. I miss your sweet voice. I miss giving you a hug and getting a kiss in return. Most of all, I miss you lying in bed next to me at night. That bed gets big and lonely when you're not here to share it with me. But I don't have to tell you that, you're experiencing the same thing. You know what it's like waking up alone in the morning. You're spending your nights alone, aren't you, Loren? There, I finally threw it out there. I was wondering what she would say. All I heard was some muffled talking. Loren, are you there? I asked. You were sleeping alone, right? Then she was back. Right, honey, that's right, she lied. Listen, Jeff, I'm freezing here and I'm all wet. I have to go now. I'll talk to you tomorrow, okay? I didn't answer. I love you, she said. I love you too, I responded. Right, goodbye Loren. I hung up the phone. I packed the tripods and microphone next. I packed what little clothes I had with me. It had been a while since I had eaten. I put on my disguise and went down to the hotel restaurant to eat. I took the camera with me to review the day's footage. As I was taken to a table by the hostess, I saw Len and Beckman sitting in a booth. I walked right by them and was seated two tables away and a little behind them. I was at Lauren's back, facing Beckman. I was able to snap a couple of photos without them noticing. When the waitress came with my food, I did see Loren look my way, but she showed no concern. She obviously did not recognize me. I must have looked like any other tourist, reviewing the day's photos on the camera. I quietly ate my meal, sneaking a peek at the two lovebirds. I did notice Len look my way one more time, but there was no recognition on her face. I finished eating and left first with them still sitting in the booth. Once again, sleep was hard to come by. I was up and sitting on the balcony at 7 o'clock the next morning. I'd moved the plants back inside the room. I no longer cared if they saw me. I had the evidence I wanted, not that I actually wanted to find any. I was saddened that I had proof that Loren was cheating. I was looking at the sunrise when I saw a white van with the blue February lettering on it pull up at 7.15. Loren and Beckman got into the van, and it drove off. I'll be damned, I thought. They actually were doing some work this week. I had two things left to do this morning. First, I accessed one of the two computers the hotel provided for the guests. I printed two pictures that I took since I got down here. Then I went to the check-in desk and inquired who would be working the desk on Saturday morning. I found out it was a young man named Carlos. We had a chat, and I slipped him $200. If all went well, Loren and Beckman would have a little surprise when they checked out Saturday morning. I checked out and flew back to New York to take care of things back home. Now, let's look at the events at the hotel from Loren's point of view. Tuesday morning saw Jim and me up early and off for the first day of our seminars. When we returned that evening, we were both too tired to engage in any amorous pursuits. Jim actually fell asleep early while I waited up for a call from Jeff. By 10 o'clock, I was furious with him for not calling. Again, by 11 o'clock, the fear crept back into my mind. Did he know and was not calling on purpose? Should I call him? No, it was too late. I thought about what Jim said yesterday and had to agree. Jeff knew nothing. If I really believed that, why did it take so long to fall asleep that night? Wednesday was the same as Tuesday. We both dragged ourselves back to the hotel room and ordered dinner in. After eating in a quick shower, Jim was refreshed and wanted sex. I was a wreck. I couldn't think of anything except waiting for Jeff's phone call. When it didn't come, I was terrified. There was no way he would not call two nights in a row. Even Jim was beginning to become concerned. Jim's wife had called him every day. Now he was beginning to wonder. When I did not receive a phone call by 9 o'clock on Thursday, 
I called my mom and explained to her that I had not heard from Jeff since Monday and would she go to the house and check up on Jeff. My mom said, of course, and would go right over there. 30 minutes later, my cell rang, and it was from our home phone. I checked out and flew back to New York to take care of things back home. Now, let's look at the events at the hotel from Lauren's point of view. Tuesday morning saw Jim and me up early for the first day of our seminars. When we returned that evening, we were both too tired to engage in any amorous pursuits. Jim actually fell asleep early while I waited up for a call from Jeff. By 10 o'clock, I was furious with him for not calling. Again, by 11 o'clock, fear crept back into my mind. Did he know and was not calling on purpose? Should I call him? No, it was too late. I thought about what Jim said yesterday and had to agree. Jeff knew nothing. If I really believed that, why did it take so long to fall asleep that night? Wednesday was the same as Tuesday. We both dragged ourselves back to the hotel room and ordered dinner in. After eating in a quick shower, Jim was refreshed and wanted sex. I was a wreck. I couldn't think of anything except waiting for Jeff's phone call. When it didn't come, I was terrified. There was no way he would not call two nights in a row. Even Jim was beginning to become concerned. Jim's wife had called him every day. Now he was beginning to wonder. When I did not receive a phone call by 9 o'clock on Thursday, I called my mom and explained to her that I had not heard from Jeff since Monday and asked if she would go to the house and check up on Jeff. My mom said, of course, and would go right over there. 30 minutes later, my cell rang, and it was from our home phone. I picked it up, blurting out, I am so glad you finally called. Are you okay? It's me, Len. Mom replied, Jeff is not here. I looked through all the rooms in the house. He is not lying unconscious in any of them. All his clothes are in the closets, and the computer is in the office. Would you mind telling me what is going on? Nothing is going on, Mom, I lied. We had a little argument on the phone, and I guess Jeff is mad at me. I'm sure it will be alright when I finally talk to him. I am relieved to know he is not lying unconscious in one of the rooms like you said. If you hear from him, please ask him to call me. This is so unlike him. You must have said or done something really bad for him not to call you for three days, Mom replied. No, Mom, nothing that bad. Just have him call if you see him. Thanks for doing this for me. I'll see you when I get home. Bye, Mom. Well, all right, honey. I miss you and can't wait to see you on Saturday. Good night, Loren. After the phone call from my mom, I was even more worried. Where in the hell could he be? Why wasn't he at home? I realized I would have to wait two more days to find out unless he called, or I could get a hold of him. I decided to call both the home line and his cell. I got voicemail on both lines. I left beseeching messages on both lines, telling him how much I missed him and couldn't wait to speak with him. I also said if he was mad at me for any reason, we could work it out when I got home. Please don't do anything rash. Friday seemed to drag on forever. I was unsurprised not to get a phone call that night. I did call my home phone and Jeff's cell phone but did not get a return call. Needless to say, I soon found no sex that night either. I was up early Saturday morning. I was packed and dressed before Jim even got up. It was about 11 o'clock when we left the room to check out. When the elevator door opened to the lobby, I looked across to the checkout desk and saw the attendant pick up his phone and make a call. He spoke for a few seconds and hung up as we approached the front desk. Jim gave the clerk our key cards and his credit card. The badge on the clerk's shirt indicated his name was Carlos. Carlos gave Jim the credit card back and had him sign some papers. What he said next caused my brain to turn to mush. He ambushed us when he said, Mr. Beckman, Mrs. Carlson, I hope you enjoyed your stay here at the Victor and hope to see you back again soon. When I heard him say my real name, my mind went blank. All I could do was look back at him and say, What did you call me? You are Mrs. Carlson, aren't you? He asked with a sly smile. My smart answer was, Why do you think that? He placed two photos on the counter in front of us. One was a photo of Jim sitting in the hotel restaurant, the other was of me, obviously taken on the day I tried to sunbathe topless by the pool. Carlos went on to explain how he received the photos. 
A man was checking out and asked me if I knew the people in the photos. I told him I did. I told him that you were the Beckmans, as you are well known here after the display of your naked charms last Monday. The man went on to tell me that I was wrong. He said the man in the photo is, in fact, Jim Beckman, but the woman with him is not Jim's wife, but my wife, Len Carlson. He was here. Jeff was here. When did he get here? I asked. Carlos once again gave me a look I could not understand. Let me take a look, Carlos typed into his computer and informed me, Mr. Jeff Carlson checked in last Friday at 4 o'clock and checked out Tuesday at noon. Oh my god, Jim, he was here the whole weekend. I exclaimed. Carlos turned to me and asked, you're Mrs. Carlson, aren't you? Yes, I am, I shamefully admitted. Good. In that case, I have something for you, Carlos smiled that same enigmatic smile as he handed me an envelope. I looked at it. It was not addressed to anyone. I opened the envelope and took out the folded paper inside. I opened it up and read the three words printed on it, Loren, goodbye doofus. I felt as if I would faint and leaned up against Jim for support. After he studied me, he took the paper from my hand and read it. I could see a worried look come over his face as he whispered to me, Come on, Loren. Let's get out of here. But before we could leave, Carlos called to Jim, I have an envelope for you as well, Mr. Beckman. He held out his hand with the envelope. Jim stared at it for a long while. I knew he did not want to touch it. Finally, Jim took it and pulled out the paper inside and read it. Jim read it and turned to look out the window that faced Ocean Avenue and almost absent-mindedly dropped the paper to the floor. I picked up the paper and read it. Did you think you were going to get off scot-free? I spent the last two hours this morning with your wife. I don't think you will receive the homecoming you thought you were going to get. I showed her all my evidence. This is only the beginning. I will try my best to make your life a living hell. Jim was still staring out the window. I took the two pictures and the letters of Jim and me. As I was putting them in my purse, I saw Carlos pick up the phone and say, Did you hear it? I stared at him as he continued, Was it all you expected? That's good, sir. I hope to see you at the Victor again. You have made your stay a most interesting one. The same to you, sir. Goodbye, I said. Was that my husband? I asked. Carlos once again gave me that smile but said nothing. I told Jim, let's go. We have a plane to catch. On the way to the airport, I called my mom. I asked her to meet us at JFK airport. Perplexed, my mom asked, isn't Jeff picking you up? I don't know, mom. We did have that argument, and I know he is very upset with me right now. I can't believe that, honey. Jeff would never leave you stranded, Loren, my mom asked now with suspicion in her voice. What exactly was your argument about? Nothing, mom. It is nothing for you to worry about. That's it? It must have been something big for him not to pick you up, plus the trip to your house to see where he was Thursday night, no phone calls. It had to have been something big. Then, with horror in her voice and maybe some realization of what might have gone on, she asked in a loud voice. My God, Len, what have you done? I started blubbering. I haven't done anything that couldn't be fixed, Mom. Please come to the airport in case Jeff doesn't show up. If you've done what I think you've done, he won't be there. Don't worry, I'll pick you up. Then she hung up the phone. I don't remember much about the cab ride to the airport or going through security and boarding the plane. It was as if my mind just shut down and I was operating on autopilot. I did not start to have any lucid thoughts until we were in the air. Once my mind started working again, I pulled out the photos of Jim and me. It was obvious when the picture of me was taken. Jeff had to see what transpired between Jim and me on Monday. I then looked closely at the picture of Jim. He was sitting in a booth and wearing a black shirt. The only time he wore that shirt was on Monday evening at the hotel restaurant. A cold shiver went down my spine. The guy sitting with the Mets ball cap and camera must have been Jim. If he saw everything we did on Monday, I knew a divorce could be in my future. Another thing was bothering me. In Jeff's letter to me, he called himself Doofus. I only called him Doofus once, and that was when I answered his phone call on Sunday. Somehow, he must have had us wired for sound. 
I shuddered to think what he would do if he heard our whole conversation. I could only hope he would pick me up at JFK to take me home, though I thought the odds of that happening weren't good. Jim was sitting in the seat next to the window. Every time I looked at him, he was looking out the window, but I knew he was really seeing nothing. I spent most of the flight home staring at the letters and pictures. I kept going over in my mind the phone calls I received from Jeff. If Jeff was in Miami, who knows what he saw or heard? The not knowing terrified me the most. The most disturbing thing was the last phone call. I knew that night that something was wrong. Something was off with that call. His attitude was off, and there was something I missed. I now felt it was very important. And Jim sticking his tool in my face made me miss it. After running all the events through my mind, I knew I could do nothing until I saw Jeff again. When the flight landed, I couldn't wait to leave the plane. I ran through the terminal until I left the security area. If Jeff was coming to pick me up, I should see him there. There is a small ramp which leads to the concourse where Jeff should be waiting. I said a quick prayer as I came off the ramp. I saw my mom waiting for me. Is Jeff here? I asked. Mom shook her head left to right and said, No. Jim followed right behind me and looked around but did not see Jane. He looked crestfallen. He quickly took out his phone and made a call to his wife. Jane, it's me. Will you pick me up? He asked. He listened for a while and then ended the call. He looked at us and said, She hung up. She's not coming. He walked to a bench and put his face into his hands. I was sure he was crying. My mom walked to Jim, pulled him by his arm, and said to me, Let's go. I'll drive you both home. On the drive to my house, mom kept giving me withering looks. Once I turned to look at Jim, he was looking out the window, and tears were streaming down his face. Like me, I thought he was thinking this trip was a stupid idea, definitely not worth it. Arriving home, I did not know if Jeff would be there. I asked Jim to wait in the car. A confrontation would not be good at this point, if ever. I ran into the house yelling, I'm home, Jeff. There was no response. Jeff, are you here? I called out again. Silence. I ran through the house, looking for Jeff. I went into our bedroom and found his closet and dresser empty. Panicking, I ran past mom standing by the dining room table, going straight to Jeff's office. When I looked in the room, I knew I was in trouble. The office was empty. Realizing he was gone, I walked into the living room and heavily sat down. It took only a few moments to appreciate the fact that he had four days to make plans. The removal of his clothes and personal items may be just the beginning. What else had he done? Eventually, I turned to look at my mother. She was standing by the dining room table with an envelope in her hand. Mom handed the papers to me. The writing in Jeff's hand simply said divorce paperwork. She then handed me a jewel case with a sheet of paper attached. The paper said, if you want to know why, look at the DVD. Mom already had the disc out of the case and walked to the TV. She turned on the TV and the DVD player, then slipped the CD into the slot. She took the remote and sat down on the new sectional and insisted on having Jeff reluctantly buy me before quickly taking me out to pick it out. I realize now that he always gave me everything I wanted with very little difficulty. Before Mom could start the DVD, Jim opened the door and asked, Is everything alright? No, Jeff is not here, his clothes are gone as well. It looks like he has left me. I'm sorry it came to this. I will call a cab and wait outside. I have to get home and try to repair my marriage. I only hope I can, Jim told Len. I only hope I can, he said as he walked out the door. For his children's sake, I hoped he could too. After Jim left mom started the DVD. I sat down next to mom as the first scene opened. I was appalled to see myself walking to the pool in the small red bikini with Jim following along behind me. I was obvious he was leering at my butt. My mom gave a quick glance my way then turned back to the screen. I tried to take the remote from her hand but she would not give it up. I watched myself give amorous kisses to Jim and felt ashamed with mom sitting there. Her eyes never left the screen. The next scene opened with Jim and me walking out of Loomis Park. 
The big difference in this scene is that you could hear us talking when the phone rang and I called Jeff Doofus. I realized that he had heard everything we said that morning. I was trying to remember if I had said anything incriminating when I heard Jim say that our affair had been going on for six months. Mom stopped the DVD, put her face in her hands, and started crying. I apologized. I'm sorry, Mom. I don't know how I let this happen. She gave me a disgusted look and pressed play again. I listened as I told Jim W.R. Stud. I absolutely revolted myself with that comment. The third scene was of me topless at the pool. My per mom had to watch me put myself on display and let Jim maul my body and manhandle me in public at the pool. I thought how dismayed she must feel looking at my debauchery. My heart sunk when I thought how mom must have felt watching my wickedness. Next came the scene where I pulled Jim into the room to have sex. Within the next scene was the worst. I finally got to hear what I missed that night on the phone. There was no video but Jeff must have recorded his side of the conversation. Jeff said, you were spending your nights alone, aren't you, Len? Then I heard muffled talking, that must have been when Jim stuck his tool in my face. Then Jeff asked again, Loren, are you there? You were sleeping alone, right? It was said with such venom that if I heard it, I would have known that he knew. Thanks to Jim, I never heard it all, I said was, right, honey, that's right. The next scene showed a hand covering the camera lens, and it became apparent he was taking the camera off a tripod. The image on the screen moved wildly, finally stopping, looking out the sliding glass door onto the balcony. It appeared to be placed on a table. Jeff reappeared and sat on a chair, dismantled the microphone, and started to fold up the tripods, placing them in a black canvas bag. Abruptly, a scream pierced the night. I knew it was the moment that Jim gave me that incredible orgasm. Jeff's head swiveled to look out into the darkness. As his head turned back, I could see the agony on his face. He put his head down, and I heard quiet sobs for about five seconds. Then he seemed to pull himself together, drying his eyes on the bottom of his t-shirt. Then he spoke out loud to himself, that's the second time she has done this to you, Jeff. It will never happen again. He then stood, walked to the camera, and the screen went blank. Mercifully, the show was over. He had skillfully captured my infidelity for all to see. No one was more aghast than my mom, who hung her head and cried silent tears. No one was sadder, except for me. When I saw Jeff's tears, I was filled with self-loathing. When he said the second time, I was confused. I did not know he had cried over me before. When he said it would never happen again, I was filled with fear. Fear for what I had done to my marriage. Mom asked me, what are you going to do now? Do you want to save your marriage or run off with that guy? Outside, my God, Mom, I love Jeff. Of course, I want to save my marriage. I'm not running off with Jim. He has a wife and two children. He will never leave them. Whether he gets to save his marriage will not be his choice to make. It won't be your choice to save your marriage either. That will be up to your husband, if you still have one. He has had many days to make up his mind. You already have divorce paperwork sitting on your dining room table. What other things has he thought to do? If you really want to keep Jeff, you better talk to him soon and give him a good reason to take you back. I wouldn't wait too long. He already has a big head start. I called Jeff's cell number as soon as mom left. He hadn't answered any of my phone calls, and I wasn't sure if he would answer now. I knew I had to try. Surprisingly, he answered on the second ring. There was no anger in his voice, and chillingly, there was no emotion at all. Loren, what do you want? He asked. Jeff, we need to talk. Will you talk to me? Sure, Loren. When do you want to do this talking? Tomorrow, any time you can make it. Okay, Loren. Tomorrow at two. Goodbye. Short and to the point, I thought. I did not like the lack of emotion I heard, or didn't hear, in his voice. He sounded so cold, it was as if he had made up his mind and was not going to change it. He was going to get the confrontation over with as quickly as possible. If I were wearing boots, I would be shaking in them. I realized this would not be easy. The next afternoon, I was looking out the front window when I saw his car pull into the driveway. Instead of coming in the front door, 
he walked around the side of the house to enter through the rear door. I ran into the kitchen and sat at the table that was set for lunch. Jeff walked through the door. I think he was surprised to see me sitting there. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for meeting me today, he nodded his head in reply. He sat at the table, looked at the place setting, and then turned back to me with a questioning look. I thought you might be hungry. I have lunch prepared in the fridge if you want to eat. He shook his head no, saying, I have already eaten, and pushed the plate away. He looked at me again, his expression screamed at me, you wanted to talk, so talk. I began, Jeff, I want to tell, no, I need to tell you how sorry I am. It looked like Jeff was going to say something in reply, but I cut him off. I know what you're going to say. Sorry. Sorry for getting caught or sorry for cheating. By the look on his face, I knew I was correct. Yes, I am sorry I was caught, but not for the reason you might think. I am sorry that I ever started cheating in the first place. The thing that bothers me the most about it is the pain and hurt I see on your face caused by my foolish actions. Knowing that I caused that is tearing me apart inside. Can you forgive me, Jeff? Even if you do, I don't know if I could ever forgive myself. I waited for Jeff to speak, he said nothing. I could see pain, anger, confusion, and even love flash across his face while I waited for a response. When he finally spoke, I was surprised at what he said. Do you know that when I woke up in the morning, I would lay in bed and watch you sleep? Or after I would finish my shower, I would sit on the chair next to the bed and watch you. I knew he did. I caught him a few times. On occasion, I would open one eye and say, what? He would smile and laugh quietly, coming to me and giving me a kiss on the forehead. You look so peaceful lying there, even beautiful, at least to me. I would gaze at your face, looking at your eyes, every curve of your face, the way your nostrils would flare, the way your mouth would open slightly, as if you were dreaming, maybe about me. Now I think maybe about him. I thought how lucky I was having you in my life. My guardian angel sent you to me to give color and brighten my otherwise drab existence. You've taken that away from me. The color and light are gone now. Since Wednesday, when I wake up in the morning, I still smile to myself and think how lucky I am to have you, how much love I have for you, until I roll over to look for you and you're not there. Then I remember. I remember what you did, and the pain and hurt return. That has happened every morning since. The only difference is that every morning, I love you a little less, and the pain is not as bad. I realized that my mom was right, I waited too long. Maybe if I got home on Wednesday night, I could have talked to him and maybe made a difference. It seems that now I am too late. He has run what happened in his mind, and the choice he made is to divorce. The last thing I want, please, Jeff, don't make a hasty choice. I know I've been a, and I don't deserve any consideration, but I beg of you, give me a chance to make it up to you. Give me a chance to show you I can be the wife you deserve. Please, give me a second chance. I looked at him, awaiting his answer. I saw his eyes tear up, then a tear run down his cheek. I reached over to his face and wiped the tear away with my thumb. I swore you wouldn't make me cry again. Now look at me, he commented sadly. Jeff, I heard you say on the DVD, this was the second time you cried over me. When was the first time, Loren? I fell in love with you when you got out of your dad's car. The first time I laid eyes on you, my best memories are of that summer we spent together. My worst memory is when you deserted me at the harvest dance. You tricked me and dumped me for another guy, just like this time. You left me to be ridiculed by Billy Barber and the rest of the football team. I don't know how many nights I cried at night in my bed where no one could see me, so you see the Monday night was the second time I cried over you. The tear that just fell as I get the third time. I'm sorry, Jeff. I seem to be saying that a lot today. This will sound foolish to you, but it was just sex. Foolish, illicit sex. He's gone, and I could care less. I will never see him again, and I won't miss him at all. All I need is you by my side. I don't know, Loren. I saw you do things in public. You went topless for him. You let him put his hands all over you at the pool. What he said next sent shivers through my body. He shook his head sadly and said, I heard the scream. I know I can't compete with that. I won't compete with another man. 
I won't compete with the memory of that other man for my wife. If we stay together, I will always be competing with this ghost, trying to match your other man. You won't have to compete with anybody. You will never understand unless it happens to you again. Jeff sadly shook his head and began to rise from his seat. I thought he was about to leave. I saw my marriage going up in smoke. I don't know what possessed me. I leapt out of my chair, knocking it over, ran to Jeff, and gave him a bear hug that I wouldn't let go of. All the while, I was babbling, Don't go, Jeff. Please don't leave me now. When I saw your letter at the hotel, I realized what I was doing. I found out that you and my marriage are what are important. Please forgive me and take me back. He put his arms loosely around me and gently stroked my hair. After a while, he placed his hands on my shoulders and gently moved me back from him so he could look into my eyes as he spoke to me. Whenever I thought of us in the future, I saw the two of us together, a house surrounded by a white picket fence, just like in the movies. We would have two sons and a girl like you for me to spoil. She would have me wrapped around her finger, just like her mother did. I saw us planning weddings, celebrating anniversaries, and special birthdays. I saw us growing old together, our love supporting us through the hard times. Now, I see nothing. I have a big black hole where there used to be love. I see the numbing darkness of a life without you. He backed away, saying, I have to go. I have something to do. Don't go, we have so much to discuss. No, I have to write a thank you letter. What letter could be more important than trying to repair our marriage? And who do you need to write a letter to? Ronnie Millsap. Why? What does he have to do with this? He helped me to dump a cheating wife. He turned and walked out the door, whistling a tune I later learned was stranger in my house. Five years later, my wife asked me to pull the car around to the front of the house. We were going to my folks for a Memorial Day cookout. I walked out the back door, past the newly built tin car garage, to the cliff overlooking the beach below, across the Long Island Sound to the shore of Connecticut. I no longer lived in the rented house in Nassau Shores, but in the old town of Mutton Town. Turning back to the garage, I had to decide what car I wanted to take to my parents' home. My eyes settled on garage number five. I clicked the remote and stood by while the door went up to reveal my newest acquisition. I closed the door, started the engine. I loved the sound of the powerful rebuilt 3090 V8 Ford engine. As the car cleared the garage, I lowered the convertible top and pulled around to the circular drive in front of the house. I got out and turned to look at the latest object of my affection, a 1961 Ford Thunderbird convertible with gleaming chrome, black paint, interior, and roof. God, she was beautiful. My wife opened the door and made a frown. The baby and I cannot drive with the top down. You have to put it up. I sighed and told her, okay, I'll put it up. But it looks so much cooler with the top down. If you ever want me to be in it with my top down again, you better put it up now. My mind went back to that day when I first got the car and we went out driving with the top down and my wife pulled her top down and I quickly hit the button to put it up. She smugly smiled. She knew how to use her prodigious sexual power. I met not two months before the divorce to Len was final. The one thing that Mr. Diamond, the bank president, agreed on with his ex-wife was their adopted child from Romania. While they hated each other, they both loved that little girl. The Diamonds ran a charity to help the plight of Romanian orphans. I knew I was expected to attend the $1,000 per place fundraiser, as I had become a favorite of Mr. Diamond. I was seated at his table next to his wife. There was an empty seat next to me. Before I sat down, I looked at the card on the table, it said reserved for Ikarova. As I sat down, I nodded my hello to Mr. Diamond and placed a small kiss on the cheek of the ex-Mrs. Diamond. I took a second glance at my boss because he had this mischievous smile on his face. It seemed like only seconds before this beauty in black sat down in the seat next to me. Mr. Diamond's face being duh, and his smile never faded as he introduced me to Ianina, pronounced Ianina. Karova, a Victoria's Secret lingerie model. I later found out that Na herself was a Romanian orphan and a member of the board that ran the charity. Na and I hit it off that night. We talked about our lives. She told me about her horrific life in the Romanian orphanages. I think she had me almost in tears. I wanted to hold her and protect her. 
She told me later that she could feel the empathy from me, and it made her want to find out more about me. She was asked to dance by many of the unattached men at the affair, but she turned them all down. I did not ask her, as I thought she did not want to dance. Nina took the matter into her own hands and asked me to dance. I said yes, of course. We dated for two years before getting married. The wedding was held at Mr. Diamond's estate in Southampton, New York. I thought his wife was a little young for him at 35 to 61, but he always had a smile on his face, so what do I know? We had a great first year. When Na came to me and said she wanted to have a baby, I asked her if she realized having a baby would put her model and career on hold for a long time. She looked straight into my eyes and informed me that the one thing she wanted most in this world was to have my baby. A big smile crossed her face as she said, maybe more than one. I'm sure a big smile crossed my face, and I suggested, I think we should start trying right away. We both laughed and ran to the bedroom. A year and a half later, our son, Jeff Jr., was born. We got in the car after settling Jeff Jr. in the car seat in the rear of the car. The only non-stop part of the T-Bird was the air conditioner I had installed. I knew from experience that once Nina got all dressed up, she wanted nothing to spoil her hair. She would rather ride in 100 degrees heat than get one hair out of place. Getting the AC installed would make it more pleasurable for both of us. As we walked into my dad's backyard where he was barbecuing burgers and dogs, I was shocked to see Len and her mom, Cheryl, sitting at the table talking to my mom. Now I was carrying Jeff Jr. and walked to the table and sat down. Mom quickly took her favorite and only grandson from Na. I went to dad and asked, what the hell are they doing here? My dad said, keep your voice down. Your mom invited them. She and Cheryl have become close since Frank died. Loren was all alone, so your mother invited her also. You know she had a hard time getting rid of that a-hole Billy Barber after you two got divorced. I knew she married Billy after I met Na. I didn't think she was that stupid. Well, she did cheat on me with that a-hole Beckman. I thought for sure they would have gotten divorced, but instead, his wife took him back. She did have two kids to worry about, that must make a difference. For a long time, I hired a PI to keep track of him. Every time he got near getting a good job, I had the word put out that he was a bad employee, and he lost out. It went on until he or his wife figured out that I must have a hand in his string of bad luck. Jane Beckman called and straight out asked me if Jim's bad luck at getting a job had anything to do with payback from me. Before I could answer, she told me that it not only hurt Jim but herself and her two kids. She went on to say that she thought it was horrible what he did to me, but don't take it out on her children. I didn't come right out and tell her I was involved, but I did say that I was sure he would have an easier time getting a job from now on. She thanked me profusely and apologized for him screwing up my marriage. I have no idea what he's doing now, as I let the P.I. go along with all the remaining hate I had for him. Actually, it was a big relief to get rid of the baggage. I took my son from Na and said hello to Len and Cheryl. Then, walking over to a bench by the rear door to the kitchen, a few moments later, Cheryl Scavo sat down next to me and reached out her arms to hold Jeff Jr. We sat quietly as she played with my eight-month-old son. Finally, she looked at me with tears in her eyes and lamented, he should have been my grandson. I would have made the best grandma. You know that, don't you, Jeff? I looked closely at Cheryl Scavo, she had aged over the last five years. I knew our divorce had been hard on her. She always liked me and was thrilled when Loren and I got married. I know you would have, Mom. You were a great mom to Len, and I know you would have been the best grandma too. Thank you, Jeff. I have missed you the last five years. Oh, and congratulations on your promotion at the bank. Your dad tells me that you're in the number two position there now. Yes, Mr. Diamond finally retired, with a little pressure from the board of directors. They moved Howard Goldman to the top spot, and he took me along with him to executive vice president in charge of operations. Basically, if I keep my nose clean, when Howard leaves, I should move up to the president's position. Loren wanted to talk to you but was afraid to come over. Can I tell her it's okay? Sure, Mom, I replied. It's been five years. I am sure we can talk civilly. Lauren's mom went back to the table and spoke to her. Before she could get up, Na came to me and said, Be gentle with her, Jeff. 
She is very fragile. Don't upset her. I nodded my assent. Now walked away. As Loren walked up, I said, Hi, Loren. You're looking good. Hi, Jeff. You do too. Na is beautiful, Jeff, inside and out, and a good person. I can tell. Thank you. I have been lucky to have two beautiful wives. That's not true. I may have been attractive outside, but inside, not so much. That's not true, you are beautiful inside and out. You got blinded by Jim Beckman. I'm sure it was something I did to drive you away. Now, that's really not true. Do you remember what I did at the dance with Billy Barber? What did you do there? No, it was me. There's something inside me that screws all the good things up. Something that's not so pretty. Let's change the subject. Mom tells me that you received another promotion at work. I always knew you would rise to the top. Well, good things have happened to me in the last five years. I looked at Na and smiled. When I turned back to Loren, I saw she was looking at Na too. She turned to me and smiled as well. Jeff, there's one thing I need to clear up from that time five years ago. I hadn't wanted to go there, but she brought it up. It was the telephone conversation where I called you a dud. I want you to know that was the first time I ever called you that. To this day, I don't know why I did it. That's not why I brought that day up. It's what I said to Jim about you that day. I told him that you would be president of the bank and about how much money you made. I realized it sounded like I only wanted to be with you for the money. That's not what I meant at all. I knew you would be a success. I was always so proud of you. I just wanted to be there when you accomplished your goal. That's what I wanted to share with you. It was never about the money, please believe it. When I first heard it, I was sure it was about the money. It wasn't until I let Na hear what you said. She is the one that suggested that I did not have it right. She thought that from the look on her face, you were not putting me down but bragging about me to JY. It made me feel so much better about you, I think I started to forgive. Then there is one more thing. I need to thank you for. What's that? What you did for Jane Beckman. She called me crying about what you had been doing to Jim. She asked me to call you, but I told her it would be better coming from her. I gave her your number at the bank. She called to tell me that Jim had finally gotten a job that could support them. She wanted me to thank you for her. I'm glad it turned out well. I never thought about her or the children. I am glad it's over. I stood up and hugged Loren. As we walked to the table, Loren was crying happy tears, and Na was beaming happily at me. We sat at the table and had an enjoyable day. On the ride home that night, we had the convertible top up, but Na had her top down. It turned out to be another wonderful day.